mystics, masters, and paths of enlightenment, <laughs> which sounds probably so very deep. And uh, so I thought we needed to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> there we go. So that's our vision 2020. What's going on there? Okay, it looks great on my screen. <laughs> All right, so I thought we'd start out by just talking about our definitions. What am I talking about when I'm saying enlightenment? What does that mean? And I have a few different definitions came from some different folks. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, how many of you know that name? Right, the power of now. He says enlightenment is simply your natural state of felt oneness, of felt oneness with being. That means we're always one. We don't always feel it. So the enlightened feel that presence. They feel that, that state of oneness. It's a state of connectedness with something that is immeasurable and indestructible, something that is paradoxically essentially you and, let so m and yet so much greater than you. It's a great definition. Here's another. In the end, enlightenment is nothing more than the natural state of being. That's from Adyashanti. And then Jack Kornfield, a very famous Buddhist teacher, says that enlightenment is a release of identification with the changing conditions of the world, resting in awareness. Now that's a great state to be in, right? To be in that place of calm and centeredness and loving and knowing no matter what else is going on in the world around you, no matter all of those things that are changing, that is what it is to, to be enlightened, part of it anyway. I don't know that we can ever put really words to what that is because it really is an experience that we all have. So then our other word, mystic. What is a mystic? This is the Catholic priest, the Franciscan priest, Father Richard Rohr, who said, don't let the word mystic scare you. It simply means one who has moved from mere belief systems or belonging systems to actual inner experience that? Someone who's moving from belief to knowing. All spiritual traditions at their mature levels agree that such a movement is possible, it is desirable, and it is even available to everyone. So this idea of enlightenment is something that is, is available and actually desirable for each one of us. It's not for certain sages that live in mountains and in caves and things like that. It's for everyone, for every one of us. Mirabi Starr, who wrote a book, I can't remember the name of it, but it has something to do with women and mysticism. She says, a mystic is a person who has a direct experience of the sacred. Achieving that sacred or divine experience requires transcending established belief systems, bypassing the intellect, and dissolving identification with the ego self. There's that word again, transcending belief systems. A mystic is someone who can let all that stuff aside and have their own direct experience of the divine. Is that something that you, I'm assuming that most of you are interested in that, that's why you come to a spiritual center, so that you can have that relationship and experience yourself. So that word, belief system, I don't know if you saw my title today, that's why I was so excited that I could come to a center for spiritual living and my official title was Rising Above the BS That Has Kept You Sick, Scared, Broke, or Playing Small, Part 1. <laughs> you like it? You like it? That's why I started with Lighten Up. So if, sorry if it offends you. <laughs> Being a little irreverent today. But what is your BS? What's the BS that we're talking about? Belief systems, right? How many of you have felt some kind of BS in your life that has kept you broke, playing small, afraid, fill in the blank. We all have them. It's part of the universal condition. So what is, what is that belief system? A belief system is an ideology. It's a set of principles or a worldview that helps us interpret our everyday reality. It's shortcuts. It's how we make meanings to things. So we don't have to figure out every situation we walk into like it's brand new. Does that make sense? Right, it, it kind of shortcuts, it gives you um, just a way of making sense, a way of making sense of your world. It helps us make sense of the world around us and our, and our place in it. Your belief system is shaped and influenced by your personal experiences and the values and beliefs of the family and culture in which you were raised. 
core beliefs are formed when we're children. Do you all have a sense of what I'm talking about? I've used the term before, paradigm. A paradigm means your worldview. It's what we're, what we're kind of what we're born into. So I love the analogy with this and trying to explain how people can kind of wrap their mind around what is the belief system. The analogy of life being some kind of production. Didn't Shakespeare say that, that all of life is a stage? Or that we're all actors on stage? So I think, for me, the analogy is like, we are all actors in a movie. But we are not only actors, we are the writer of the film. We are the actors in it, and we are the directors. There is a big studio, there's a producer that put all of that. Well, it's available to all of us. The crew is out there, all of the, the backstage, everything that we need to put our production on is available to us. Thing is, when we come into this physical life and we put this body on, we forget that we're the actors in the role. We forget that we're the ones who are writing the story. We forget that we're the director and we get so engrossed in our part that we feel like it's happening to us, not that we're creating it. Does that make sense? Everyone? So I was thinking about movies myself, and you know, if, if you could think of the movie that defined your, your growing up or your family life or whatever, and how that would shape you. So we happen to come into a movie that started in the 20th century, all of us, right? I think everybody in this room. And you had a certain role. So if I was to look at my life, my early kind of family picture, and y'all who are psychology people will be picking this apart, I'm sure. <laughs> My family was kind of like a cross between The Godfather. Did anybody see The Godfather? You know that family in The Godfather? And my big fat Greek wedding. <laughs> How that works together, it's an interesting mix, isn't it? But you get the picture. Only we were Puerto Rican. So our food was different, <laughs> but there was the, the fun and the laughter and the joy of the big fat Greek wedding family. And there was also the, the gritty, the, the kind of violence, the, the stuff that was of the godfather and very strict roles that people had to play. So that was a part of my life. And then they Grady, didn't they didn't kill anybody. No, let me just say that. No, they didn't kill anybody. I have a lot of cops in my family, actually. Yeah, so crime was kind of the family business, but not in the, <laughs> the way that you're thinking. <laughs> you may be thinking. Uh, so then Grady and I have been catching up on movies here recently, and I just we just saw two movies, and I thought, my gosh, that's my life too. How crazy that is. The first one, you, 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 well, the, the Joker. Has anyone seen The Joker yet? And there's some really gritty, icky stuff about The Joker. The Joker is... Uh, it's the, the Marvel comic story, and it's kind of the backstory of the Joker's life and how DC, DC sorry, DC <laughs> Comics. <laughs> and uh, so you get the backstory of how he got to be so demented and crazy, and there was a little, there were mental health issues in my family. My, my grandmother had, had um, was schizophrenic, and so there were things that go in a, in a family structure where there is mental illness that that creates, you know, kind of shapes who we are and how we come up. So there was that piece. But then there was Mr. Rogers. There was the Mr. Rogers piece. Now, how those two things go together, I'm still working that out. But that was another profound influence. How many of you have seen that movie, Mr. Rogers? We're getting, we should, when it comes out, play it here. Um, he's probably somebody that I will feature as one of those enlightened beings or a master because he truly was. So there was that aspect of, of my life, and both those things were playing in my childhood. So those things created certain beliefs and ideas about how life is and what is so. Each one of you has a movie. Each one of you came into a role that had certain prescribed parts that go with it. I'm teaching at the prison again. Just started, I've, we've done two classes at the prison. I've got a class with 25 men that are there for all kinds of offenses. Some of them will never get out of prison. And it was really interesting to see this whole belief system in play with one of the gentlemen as he talked about having been incarcerated for over 25 years. And finally, uh, his daughter came and found him at the prison and went, jumped through all the hoops she needed to jump through that so that she could visit with him and be with him, and they established this relationship. And he was so excited, and he was so happy until she came one day and said, um, I would like to bring my wife. And he said, oh, 
that really goes against my beliefs. Yes, you can't visit. And I, I, think, I don't know if my, my mouth dropped open or what, but I was thinking, well, probably what you all are thinking, some of what you all are thinking. Um, I'll give you the update because I have a feeling that's going to change. <laughs> that belief system, that belief system to understand where do these things come from and to help people be able, this is part of what we do in, in this work, in this teaching, and what I'm doing at the prison is to have people identify what their belief systems are. Identify them and see if they still work for you. So he's got some competing values. And it's a matter of finding and determining what's the most important value. And is this belief that I'm holding, is it, is it valid? Is it valid? See, our belief systems are the invisible force that's behind all of our behavior and our experience of life. I'll tell you another belief system. I just heard this one yesterday, and this is maybe another one of those prevalent ones, that uh, you have to, the, anybody belong to the clean play club? <laughs> the clean play club. Like, you have to clean your play? Did people grow up with that? How many of you grew up with that? That's another one I grew up with. My grandmother would literally sit by the garbage can and say, you're not throwing that food out. There are starving kids in India and China, and you need to eat your, Africa, China, wherever, right? There are starving kids somewhere else, and somehow my eating this is going to make that better. I don't understand, <laughs> but that's what we grow up with, right? So this, this, this man had ingrained this so much. He's 300 pounds, and he sits in front of a plate and feels like he has to keep eating it because he has to leave that plate clean because that's what he was taught. That's the belief. Is it valid? <laughs> Who am I to say? <laughs> but you have to look at, is it working for you? That's the question, is it working for you? So your BS, your belief systems, are what determine your possibilities. How far you go in life, what you believe is possible for you, all starts right up here. Our belief systems are the glasses through which we each view the world and anticipate what is likely to unfold. Our behavior is always loyal with our beliefs. Think about that. Our belief systems are the glasses through which we each view the world and anticipate what is likely to unfold. Our behavior is always loyal with our beliefs. So let's, um, let's take another possibility here, another one. Say you're from a family where there's been divorce and somebody left, and now you have this, or you're, you're waiting, I, I've seen this too, kids who are wanting to see mom or dad, and they make the, you know, they've got the assigned time and the date, and that parent doesn't show up. And there's that crushing disappointment. And so what happens? That young child makes up a belief about people. People can't be counted on. I'm gonna shut myself down so I don't get hurt. And that belief may very well serve while that child is just trying to get through life. But what happens when you become an adult now and you want to make relationships with somebody else and start your own family and you still have these walls up? Can anyone relate to what I'm talking about? Right, so our beliefs is what determines our possibilities and what, how we think life is going to turn out for us. Miguel Angel Ruiz, this is the son of Don Miguel, right? He said, we only see what we want to see. We only hear what we want to hear. Our belief system is just like a mirror that only shows us what we believe. So you may say, well, you all say that there's so much abundance and that anything is possible, but I just, I'm just not seeing it. What is your belief saying? It's not possible. It's not possible. It doesn't matter if it is. It doesn't, you can... You can have money waiting for you. I think Mary, Mary Morrissey tells this story about someone who calls her at some point and lets her know that she's got, like, I forget, an inheritance that she didn't know was there. So it was there. It was there, but because she didn't know it was there, she didn't believe, I guess, you know, that it wasn't, it wasn't available to her. You have to be able to see it, to envision it, in order to embody it. It has to start up here first. And then the greatest of the masters right, the greatest enlightened one that we, most of us, are familiar with, Jesus. And what did he say? He said, it is done unto you as you believe. 
is done unto us as we believe. He didn't say, mind you, he didn't say it's done unto you as you deserve. It's done unto you as you would like. It's done unto you as you wish. No, it is what? It's done unto you as you believe. As you believe, as much as you can believe. That is what is possible for you. But so many of us are carrying around all of this BS that tells us we're not capable enough, we're not smart enough, we're not whatever, fill in the blank, right? We all have our what we're not enough or that we're too much of something else. I can't have this because I'm too much. I can't have that because I'm too little. I can't do this because I don't have the money. I don't, can't do this because I didn't get the education. I just, whatever, go on and on and on. We are the ones who have put our own limits on ourselves. We are the ones who put ourselves in the box. Mm. I say we, but as you see, right, it starts, it starts way earlier on. As we all made this agreement to come into this time and place and these bodies and this experience. We could have been born in another time, place, experience. Think of how different your life would be if you had been born in another country, if you had been born in another decade or another century. You would have come into the world with the belief systems that went with that. Am I making sense? Okay. So don't ask if the belief system is right or wrong or good or bad. The better question is, does this still serve me? Does this belief system still serve me? Is it still working for me? Is it bringing me joy? Is it enhancing my life? Does this belief make me want to get up in the morning and start my day? Does this belief make me come alive? And if the belief that you're holding doesn't do those things, it's not serving you. Maybe you need to look at it again. Try and get a different angle on it. And if you can't do it yourself, come and talk to a spiritual counselor. Or better yet, ask your friends or your family. Ask your spouse. Ask your significant other. Do I have a, am I seeing this right? Or is there another way to look at this situation? I'm trying to think if I want to share another story. I think I'll. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will. I'll share another story. Um, there was a time early in our marriage when, you know, my family was so... I big fat Greek wedding, godfather family, okay? Got that? How important family was? And then Grady and I started our own family. And I would continually go and ask this relative for this advice and that relative for the other one. And, and it was always about my, my bigger family. And there was a point where my husband said, You're, they're more important to you than we are. Like, uh, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like, I, didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't see it. And then I went to this, this um, kind of a life-changing, transformational workshop called Landmark. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Landmark Forum. I did that, and I had my Landmark aha moment, waking up in the same bedroom that I'd woken up in for seven, eight, I don't know, how long were we married then? At least that long, at least that long. And I woke up that morning and I looked at my dresser and on top of my dresser I had pictures of, of my, my family, my parents, um, you know, other <laughs> relatives. I had things from high school graduation and college and all this memorabilia that I brought into my marriage. And I didn't have anything from my marriage on. Right? So all of that time leading up, the stuff that I came into, it's how I decorated my room, and I didn't change it for all of those years. And then I looked at my dresser like for the first time, like, oh my God, there it is right in my face. And I made the adjustments. I made the adjustments. But it took, I didn't see it for myself, it took that seed that was planted by my husband and my desire to have better relationships and a better marriage. And so it changed things, it shifted. So those aha moments can happen like that in an instant. You have to be willing and open and looking for it. So to realize that God is ever present, ever available, is to know that all of the wisdom, intelligence, and power of the universe is right where you are. 
Your word is power when you know this. This is why everything in your life depends upon your belief and why it is done unto you as you believe. See, everything is already here, already now. All the possibilities already exist. Everything is here, and we have access to all of it. The only thing that keeps us from realizing those possibilities is our own self-imposed beliefs and our doubts about what is possible. Change your beliefs, and you will change your world. Change your thinking, change your life, change your beliefs, and you'll change your world. That comes from Ernest Holmes. The book is available right there in the bookstore. <laughs> Adyashanti says this, make no mistake about it. Enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or being happier. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seeing through the facade of pretense. It's the complete eradication of everything we imagine to be true. What's that says to me? I'll tell you in my plain English. Get rid of the BS, right? Drop the BS that is no longer working in your life. Do the work. Do the self-assessment. Look at the places where your life isn't exactly what you want to be, what you want it to be, and then think back. What what would a person who is, who is having this result, what would they be believing? What would they have to believe in order to have this result in their lives? And you kind of can separate yourself. It's the role you're playing. It's the, it's the setting that you were born into that may have you believing in certain ways. But you're not limited by that. How many of us have heard things about genetics? It runs in the family, right? We find out that that's BS. Because while you have these genes that may talk about certain, uh, certain proclivities or you, that you, you're likely to go in a certain direction, you, we know that we can behave in ways that could keep that stuff from happening. If you know that alcoholism runs in your family, you have a choice about how you behave. You have a choice about what you put in your, in your body, right? If you know that, that there's cancer or there's heart disease, or you can behave differently. It is not a sentence. Even when you have certain illnesses and people will say it's incurable, what does that mean? It is curable from within. It may be curable from within. Let's put it that way. It's a, what, how much can you believe? How much can you believe? Jesus said that all of those things he did, all the miracles, all this and more, you can do. He said that. He said that. What, what does that look like for you? Does it look like being a spiritual person, raising kids and going to work every day? Seems like it might be easier if you're sitting in a cave someplace and you don't have to deal with people, right? You could be as spiritual as you want to be <laughs> when you're at home in your meditation. And then when you get out in the car and you're on the road, that's when you see. That's when you can see. What, what's really in there? What's in there? Enlightenment is a destructive process. Right? So we're not, we're not looking to, to change anything. That's another thing about this, that, that to break this down. It's not about becoming better or being happier. You don't have to become anything. You don't have to be any. You already it. It's already there. The enlightenment is about letting go of what's not there. This is so, so clear for me now watching my grandchildren. The two-year-old grandsons, my six-month-old grandbaby, I've told you, I think they're the most enlightened beings that there are. Th they're certainly in my life. <laughs> Things happen, and it just, you know, they feel whatever they feel in the moment. If they feel sad, they're sad. If they're angry, they're angry, and they just get it all out, and they move on to the next thing. And they wake up in the morning. You ever see a, a six-month-old when they can pull themselves up by those bars in the crib? And they're just ready to go? <laughs> How many of you wake up like that? I'm just ready to start my day. <laughs> There's my mom. There's my honey. I'm so happy to. How many of us do that? <laughs> That's how we all come into this world. Each and every one of us, ready to go, ready to start the day, ready to live life. Stuff happens. You know, you let it go, and then you go out and play. You cry when you need to. You do what you got to do, and you move on. That's what we're here to do. Live life to the fullest. 
Yes. I think that's it. I don't know. Did I miss anything, honey? I go through my talks with him and I say, how does this sound? 